welcome everyone to this session of the PCST 2023 conference. It is already the fourth session of today. So we got off to a good start today. We've already had some fascinating presentations and I'm particularly um, looking forward to this session today that will you know, really look at science communication from different viewpoints, including some viewpoints that I'm particularly interested in. And I'm sure there'll be something for everyone who joins and, and listens in this session. So without any further ado, I want to st start and introduce our panel um, by one by one, as I'm gonna ask them to speak, they will have eight minutes each, a little bit flexible. And then there'll be one or two questions after each talk. And then also a final um, opportunity at the end to reflect and maybe ask some overarching questions. Let me um, just quickly make sure that everybody knows that we're recording this session because many people want to watch it later. And um, so I'm going to start now today with the overall theme of the session is learning from different viewpoints. And our very first presenter is Marcelo Pereira. And he's going to talk to us about the scientist's view about science communication. And this is something that I'm particularly interested in as well. In fact, I did my own PhD about how scientists you know, feel about public engagement and, and what they do to engage with audiences. So Marcella, Marcella, over to you. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Okay, just preparing the slides here. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Marcelo Pereira and I work with science communication at the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, which is a public university in Brazil. Today, I'm thrilled to present the results of my master's degree research, which I hope to conclude in the next few months. Uh, I had the pleasure of collaborating with my professors, Yuri Castelfranchi and Luisa Massarani on this work. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present it. So in the world of science communication, it's common for researchers and scholars to focus on understanding the public, so that their perceptions and attitudes. While that's important, um, it's also critical to understand the perspectives, attitudes, and motivations of scientists who communicate with the public. After all, they produce and share uh, scientific knowledge and their views, especially their openness to dialogue, can influence how the public perceives and uh, receives science. That's why our study aims to shed light on the perspectives of Brazilian scientists regarding science communication and, it, and its policies. By doing so, we hope to foster better communication between science and, so and society. Um, so uh, our research seeks to, to address the following inquiries. How do Brazilian scientists perceive the connection between science and society? And how uh, do they communicate scientific information to the general public? And another question would be what uh, attitudes and perspectives do Brazilian scientists have towards science communication and policies, and how can these be categorized? Um, so to answer these questions, we conducted an online survey with recipients of a research fellowship from Brazil's uh, national research agency called CNPq. Uh, the selection for this fellowship is widely regarded in, in my country as a criterion of quality and productivity for scientists. So the survey responses were collected between January and March of this year. So it's brand new data. We obtained a total of 1,600 uh, responses from all regions of Brazil and all areas of knowledge. The sample was stratified according to gender, region, discipline, and fellowship level so that we were, there were no overrepresented or underrepresented groups um, in our sample. Based on, on these responses, we conducted our analysis using a statistical method known as Latin class analysis. Uh, just to quickly uh, explain the, the, the method, it, uh, individuals can be classified into groups or classes based on a hidden variable that is measured through observ observable indicators. These indicators are the survey questions we use it, so the variables, and some questions uh, of, 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 the, of the, the, the survey are more related to models of science communication, with, while other questions deal with the management of science and technology policy. So we, we ask it both kind of questions. The output of a good Latin class model is such that re the response, uh, the, 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 sorry, the response pattern of respondents 
is uh, more similar within each class than between classes. Uh, so uh, this this chart I'm I'm showing uh, displays the probabilities of response for each question based on membership in one or of of three classes. The labels may be small and difficult to read, so my apologies. Uh, could it make it bigger? The red sections of each bar uh, represents the most positive possible re responses. Uh, so uh, the, 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 this red section, uh, these red sections are largest in class one, they are intermediate in class two, and they are smallest uh, in class three. This suggests that, that one class fully agrees with most of the questions, another partially agrees, and the third disagrees roughly. Okay. So um, this another bar chart I'm displaying uh, is the estimated proportions for each class based on our model. So the name of class one, we, we, call, it, we call that uh, the engaged democratic class because it has the strongest uh, favorable positions and represents approximately 20% of our sample. The class two, which is, has slightly less favorable, uh, favorable positions is known as the informative democratic class. And we will elaborate further on the names that we have given. Uh, and this class constitutes 54% of the sample. So more than a half of population. The final class, which is class three has uh, disagreeing or unfavorable opinions and is called the informative techn technocratic class. It makes up the remaining 26% of the sample. So I would like to uh, emphasize some of the most significant variables. So the, the, the question people answered, so that we can uh, so that we can choose the, the class names. So uh, uh, for the engaged democratic, sorry, I'm just going to stop you for one um, second. Can you minimize on your own screen um, the you know the preview thing? It's it's sort of on the right hand side of your screen because it's obscuring a part of your text. So yeah, just okay. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, okay, then it's going to help. Then we can see your presentation better. Sorry about that. Please carry on. Thank you. Uh, so for the engaged democratic class, they strongly agree with uh, mostly with these questions. Scientists must expose the risk of their research. Uh, science communication has the role to allow public participation in science and technology related discussions. Most people can understand science topics and is important to establish an equal food dialogue in uh, science communication. Uh, important to say that this class uh, think that it's very important to, to their work. Sci uh, science communication is very important to their work as scientists. So for the class two, the informative democratic class, they somewhat agree with, it's important to establish an equal food dialogue in, in science communication, participation in so of civil society on decision-making of science and, and technology subjects. They somewhat agree with that. And people have the right to know the impacts of the results of science. And they think that science communication is important to their work as scientists. So for the class three, the informative technocratic class, they uh, roughly disagree that population should be heard in science and technology policy. It is important to establish an equal food dialogue in science communication, and science communication has the rule uh, of allow public participation in science and technology related discussions. And they think that science communication is somewhat or not important to their work as scientists. So, uh, to uh, would like to to um, some notes that we would like to leave as the conclusion and to think about next steps for the research that we hope to achieve is that perceptions of scientific communication and science and technology policy are interwoven, so they're connected. Uh, this sample of scientists is more receptive to a demo demo democratic approach to managing science and technology policies than to a more uh, dialogical, um, dialogical model of science, science communication. One Further analysis of the relationship between uh, sociodemographic variables and in, in the sample and the class membership could be of interest. So which group has more women? Which group has uh, people, uh, I mean, how age relates to the, 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 the membership in each classes and so on and the disciplines and so on. So um, thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed the presentations. 
If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email address can be found in the slide. Uh, thank you again for your attention. I'll stop sharing my Yes, my thank you very much for that wonderful talk. It's it's there's a number of things that that really struck me, and it's it's new data. You've had a large number of respondents, and overall, I think for me, what stood out is that, you know, it's it's a new demand on on many scientists this idea of public communication and even dialogue and engagement and it's very fascinating to see how you've classified them and how differently re they respond how differently they feel i would like to at this stage before we move on to the next talk the, any sort of other uh question or observation that we can quickly take before we move on well i'd like i'd like to compliment marcelo uh on his work uh, Marcelo, I'm very interested in this idea of latent class analysis. So uh, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, in qualitative research, we let the respondents determine some of the groups. So um, I would, uh, maybe not right now, but um, I saw your uh, content, contact information, and I may like to correspond with you about that, that uh, method. Thank you. That would be a pleasure. Thank you. I can I can definitely see a lot of potential for further analysis, as you said at the end, and also cross country comparison. So I think if you're on a on a fantastic topic and um, methodology here, thank you so much for that. So we're going to move on now to Judith. It's it's your turn, Judith. Um, and you are going to talk about. I love that um, a demo autoethnography of the agony and ecstasy of a public information officer. Um, in my experience, you know, public information officers are crucial role players as well. And I'm looking forward to hearing your talk very much. All right, sorry. Uh, okay, I did introduce myself in my abstract, so uh, people can look at that if they want to know a little more. Judith, uh, uh, just go to the um, to the uh, presentation mode. Remember the little wine glass? You just have to click on that again. Again. Okay. Ah, thank you. Yes, I'm not a quick study. Okay, That's so fine. starting again, uh, I got my idea for this. It's not a research project. Uh, there are several people in my department who deal with autoethnography. I'm in the communication department uh, at uh, the University of New Mexico. So I wanted to look at uh, my reactions uh, to my job as a public information officer. Uh, there are two philosophies of how to look at things. Uh, you can look at things as a journey, or you can look at them in terms of the destination. You can look at things in terms of the process or you can look at things in terms of the outcome. In my case, being a PIO at a, a major research university in the United States was a dream job in the doing, but was disappointing in the outcome. So moving on here, uh, just a little bit about my background, Texas A&M University and me. Uh, if you've heard of Texas A&M University at all, you know, it's uh, been a football powerhouse. Uh, it has one of the largest stadiums, collegiate stadiums in the United States. It has a military history. It still has a core of cadets. Um, and as someone from a working class background whose parents grew up in poverty in Kentucky, and then I grew up in Ohio in a little bit better situation, I wanted to be a journalist. And I wanted to be a journalist from the age of 12 because I read a biography of Richard Harding Davis, who was a war correspondent during the Boer War. And I'm like, how exciting, not that I wanted to be a war correspondent, but the fact that he was a journalist. In junior high and high school, I was recognized as being a good writer. Uh, at the age of 17, I got to spend six weeks in a high school journalism program at Northwestern. And I, I later attended Northwestern and received a Bachelor of Science in Journalism. Uh, however, during that time, uh, I had an internship which was extremely disillusioning to me in which a newspaper editor told me to change the facts of a story to prove that someone was a communist. That didn't fit in with my idea of journalism. I was also very politically active in the civil rights movement. 
And those two things together ended up in uh, my not being able to secure a job in journalism. I went on to get married, have a family, work in uh, hospitals, work in the law. And by serendipity, I ended up at Texas A&M where they had an MS in science and technology journalism. And I thought, hey, maybe I'm going to try again. It was uh, situated in the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical uh, Sciences. Uh, it was run by Barbara Gastel. Uh, some of you may have heard of her. She wrote Science Writer's Handbook and Medical Writer's Handbook. And uh, she has been uh, prominent in the idea that ordinary people can learn to be PIOs. And I did. I became a public information officer at Texas A&M University and then an editor at Texas AgriLife um, Extension. And during all this time, I did have the benefit. Uh, I got to take science classes as part of my MS because I already had a journalism degree. So I took a lot of courses in uh, veterinary public health, et cetera. And then I also had a lot of coaching by my partner, Jeff, who ha is an, uh, master, has a master's degree in sociology, but he's also an electronics engineer. So he helped me when I was covering physics and chemistry. Later, I decided because there was a lot of job instability as a PIO, and because I had a desire for more autonomy, I decided to go on to get my PhD uh, in agriculture, as you can see there. So what was the ecstasy? The ecstasy was learning about science, uh, taking classes, doing internships in journalism, uh, and in public information. Uh, it was mentoring by some great people at Texas A&M. Um, it was belonging to some organizations which built common ground. Um, the Association for Communication Excellence, which uh, covers field agricultural biological fields. Uh, the National Association of Science Writers. And of course, PCST, which I joined as soon as I found out about it. Uh, when I was working for the Office of University Relations at Texas A&M, I had access to scientists. I mean, unfettered access. I would call them up and say, can I come and talk to you for a half hour about your um, work? And, and four hours later, I would stagger out of their offices with my head full of their work. I would write news releases, which they would review for accuracy. Um, I made friends with the Dean of the College of Geosciences with Marvin Scully, who is a world-renowned physicist and um, engineer. Uh, I met Norman Borlaug, who has a nuclear so Nobel Prize in, uh, in agriculture. And I was able to cover all these interesting things and to form really tight relationships with the college communicators. Uh, I also did some coverage of, uh, I wrote hundreds of stories, three stories a week minimum. Um, they were published on the web. Uh, the Texas A&M web at that time did a lot of promotion of our science. I also covered some politics at the Bush Library and Bush School of Government, where, uh, you know, I rubbed, you know, emails with important people. I wrote speeches for the university president. Then I went on to work as an editor for the Texas Extension Publications, where I worked with agricultural scientists to make their work understandable and usable for the public. I uh, feel like uh, Aretha Franklin. I had R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I had respect. I was serving the people of Texas. And uh, as an editor, I edited 58 publications in 18 months. And, and that was the ecstasy. Up to that point, the best job I had ever had. Now to the agony. The agony consisted of a lot of things. Uh, the media largely ignored our releases, even though we had uh, people promoting them. We were using Eureka. We were using Web of Science. And uh, nothing was getting covered. Uh, there was almost no national or regional coverage that was generated by our releases. Uh, the media was really there though for tabloid or scandalous incidents 
if porn was found on a Corps of Cadet member uh, computer, wow, that was big news. Uh, my favorite is that one of the geosciences, uh, one of the oceanographers had invented a robot that could crawl around the seafloor and collect data and, and seismic data too. While he was down there in a submersible testing his robot, he spotted a giant squid. Guess what got covered? I had phone calls from around the world about the, no expletive, giant squid, you know, and nobody cared about this groundbreaking science. Judith, you've got uh, one minute left. All right. I had a lot of, uh, we got a lot of coverage when the bonfire fell in 90, um, it wasn't 97, it was 99, with 12 killed. We got a lot of coverage there for the Texas uh, public extension publications were not widely distributed. Uh, there was no network for distributing them. So what are some of the take home lessons? Communicating science to the public is hard work. Uh, it does not necessarily need to be done by a scientist. With training, dedicated professionals can learn to communicate it, but you have to listen and you have to build relationships with the scientists. PIRs are awfully are often unjustly vilified as being ineffective in communicating science to the public. But does that stem from the PIOs or from the lack of media coverage? Uh, I found that the mainstream media were not really interested in straight or complex science studies. And agricultural publications were available to the public but not widely promoted. So finally in 2007, I left a job I loved for academe. Um, I'm at UNM now, I'm doing my own research, and no one from the campus public relations asked me about it. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope to write this up as a more um, conventional autoethnography and sh so I can share it with, no with more people. Thank you so much for that, Judith. It's, a, it's an interesting career reflection. I'm sure that many of us um, on the school could identify with some of the things you shared, both on the agony and the ecstasy side, if not everything. Um, it, it raises important questions about, you know, the role of the PIO, the recognition for the PIOs and the crucial role they play, but also about news values. You know, how do we get um, journalists to be more interested in the science? But of course, it also reminds us that, that scientists these days have many other ways of engaging with the media that, that maybe was very different in, in those earlier days in, in our careers when you really had to get journalistic mm -hmm. interest if you wanted to get public attention. Yes. So um, anybody who's got a question, for, maybe one question for Judith before we carry on? If not, I can allow you to think about this a little bit and we'll come back to it. But I, I enjoyed that, Judith. I can certainly... Um, I think it will be make a wonderful um, essay or you know reflection if you if you write that up. So there is one question from Jamana, and she asks, um, "Do you think the pandemic changed things a bit? You know, in terms maybe of media interest and also scientists themselves, how they might feel about it?" Uh, well, I can't speak for scientists. Uh, what I have seen in the media has once again. Uh, been not really a, a great deal of, of accurate information being conveyed. Uh, the media seems more interested in uh, looking at the disinformation. And uh, I did a study on the Wakefield thing in Great Britain and the coverage by the Times and the Daily Mail. And, uh, you know, sensationalist coverage always seems to win out. So um, uh, I don't know. That isn't an area of my study anymore, mm -hmm. but um, that, that's a good question. Right. Okay, so something else to think about then. We, our next pre presentation, we're going to find out what we can learn from NASA and what they can, you know, it's about audience engagement and certainly um, maybe some valuable lessons. I'm looking forward to that. So Denise, Vasquez Guevara, over to you. Hi, thank you, Marina. Thank you everybody for coming. So this study uh, comprises uh, several years of research with Dr. Ivana Svetovic from Cal Poly Pomona. And we were very interested to know how NASA communicated um, science communication through Instagram, through the feature of IGTV, now named uh, uh, Instagram video. 
So this uh, specific study that I'm leading in this overall project was uh, focused on knowing how positive lessons of content creation for science can be developed and what we found out that could be uh, possibly improved to take advantage of uh, engagement opportunities online. So the method, what we did is to take uh, 38 videos from NASA IGTV uh, between 2018 and 2019, which is now uh, the section of reels when you can find it. And we, wrote, uh, uh, we ran a qualitative content analysis thinking about using user comments uh, posted under these uh, 38 videos. And we also look at the metrics such as likes, shares, and views that can be uh, visible for any user. What we found out is positive engagement and negative uh, engagement itself. For example, in terms of high audience interest, any video, the less views that it gets is 2,000, 100 uh, minimum, up to 5.4 million views maximum which is a lot of engagement or, and cloud for social media. Uh, and people were always asking like, oh, is Mars um, having these issues too, uh, such as the earth or any other science questions? And mostly they were praising uh, science and NASA's content and had aspirational aims, such as when I grow up, I wanna be, I don't know, a NASA scientist or a rocket scientist or something like that. But in terms of negative engagement, we also found a lot of conspiracy theories and uh, confrontations and polarized positions and even online violence, people insulting each other because they were thinking about flat earth and even throwing like political claims on Democrat, uh, between Democrats or Republicans and why tax money is used for this in the United States. So, what we found out there was a lack of dialogical engagement, missing the opportunity to manage and like monitorize the audience questions that were unattended and were really good opportunities for learning. So we know like it would be impossible to respond like, I don't know, 500 comments per video, but it was very interesting to see that nobody from NASA was even liking the good comments or like claiming um, maybe later for like respect online or such a thing, such as managing the community itself. So moving away from deficit on social media to dialogic engagement, uh, we in that discussion for this wonderful paper uh, from Lee and Van Dyke, which is, I think the author is in this, in this meeting today. And we love this paper called Don't Set to Forget, which is government agencies and government itself tend to, you know, invest all these resources and create wonderful content. And once you have people engaged, you ignore, ignore them. So it's just a one-way communication conduit and you're forgetting about the main effort, which is engaging people. What we suggested is to manage social communities, social media communities around audiences' content. So for example, moderating crisis, claiming for mutual respect will be useful, but also answering to the questions that people that was already engaged in the projects were making. So for example, our lessons that we can uh, give to anybody that's making reels or like even TikToks in this time about their project is great content generates engagement. See, if you are taking already the budget or your time itself to develop an interesting content, don't take away the opportunity to establish dialogue with your audience. So for example, not attending to audience content also generates this interest. No, they know that you, you're not responding to them and you're not interested only in showing your project, but establishing a relationship. So generating social media content for scientists also has important benefits for collaboration, for creating a good reputation online, uh, such as responding to people's questions or even like mentoring a little bit those uh, young people that wants to go into science for a career. How to do that? Like we were thinking about answer the questions that are about your project. So what about this method? Like, should I prevent COVID doing this or that? Or like, what is that thing that's showing in the video next to Mars? Um, create little giveaways in content, such as wallpapers, DIG experiments and activities and so on. 
creating useful resources for audiences daily lives. Maybe for NASA, it's not that much because it's a spatial science, but a specific uh, research, for example, such as agriculture in space and how you can have like your little garden at home to help an urban gardening, for example. And creating interactive content stories using the features such as uh, parasocial relations for voting, for making questions or like making people interact on purpose. So, it's for purpose. so for example, here we look at uh, an experiment that generates engagement that already NASA is doing currently in this year. So for example, this um, scientist is making an experiment about how uh, gravity looks with water in the space and how that is made and he presents different opportunities for people also to understand what they are doing with the tax money in the space. So foster the audience participation and maybe the citizen science initiatives is also a good way to start the conversation, answering the question that audiences have timely and celebrate audiences motivation and engage them through inspirational content. So for example, features that you can use is the question, Q&A sessions, maybe a live that they already doing lives from space with like how an astronaut prepares for launch of a rocket, you know? A polling, ranking, countdowns, voting, you can use that in um, the features of the stories currently now. So how an outline of an effective strategy would look in our eyes? First, to inform what you're doing. Maybe a post of you speaking to the public saying, this is my research, this is what I do, and open the space for audiences' questions listen what people have to, to say to you and also process that to moderate future responses or create more content and learn from those experiences itself. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Denise. That was really, really fascinating. I, I couldn't agree with you more. If you are already getting your audience, I mean, in the beginning, you talked about how there were questions from the audiences, but they were not always answered. They were sometimes ignored. And it seems to me, if people actually go to the trouble of putting the opportunity there for people to ask questions, you know, the content creators, then it would be unthinkable just to ignore them. But I'm also glad that you gave so many other practical examples of strategies and tools that we can use. So that was really, really fascinating. Thank you so much. And I'm now very keen also to go and look at that platform again myself. Um, before we move on, anybody wants to see this some, um, you know, this, this also echoes the first presentation about the, I guess the, the need to move away from unidirectional sort of one way top down science communication. Um, there's a question from Alessandro who asked, do you think Hispanic psychom project are using dialogue model or are they mostly deficit? I think that's a very broad question. It obviously depends yes. a lot. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Alessandro, for your questions. And thank you also, Marina, for, for linking our presentation with Marcelo. I think mostly we tend to do deficit still. Even if you're using social media, the content is created just to inform, but not to establish dialogue. So that, so that could be also one of the reasons why people is not really engaging with you because you're just telling them what you do, but you're not up in the space for thinking about how what, what you're doing for research works in their lives. So maybe, I don't know, the experiment of gravity could be more engaging of how gravity happens for a child or like a young person or somebody else. But let's think about, I don't know, health uh, communication. If you're preventing, I don't know, diabetes, how to do a healthy meal uh, from the voice of a researcher that explores that preventive medicine or like how manage chronic illness will be very valued from the public. There's one more quick mm -hmm. question from Jamona. She asked if you perhaps have any idea how many people um, is responsible for social media at NASA? How big is the team? <laughs> So we don't know how, uh, how many, in the time of the study, one of former students from UNM where I studied and Dr. White was my professor, we knew there was like a team of 10 to five people depending the platform, mm -hmm. but itself they use like many people producing the content. So they spend a lot of resources and funding on like, I don't know, making an animation on Mars or 
using the food that she sells of the stations, but using all that money for not, you know, talking to the people that is a missed opportunity for even boostering the reputation of the agency itself. So right. we have seen many uh, changes in the current years. So I think NASA is also learning from the experiences. Right. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Denise. There's a question about time and, you know, the time it takes this engagement. It is challenging, as I said on the start. So I think we can get back to that at the end because it will pretty much apply to all the presentations. We're moving on now to um, also a fascinating topic, the evolution of the hashtag Open Science Discourse on Twitter. And I'm calling on Brian Britt from the University of Alabama to, to present next. All right, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, speak with you all today. I'm uh, Dr. Brian Britt. My colleague and I, Dr. Van Dyke, uh, are, are uh, very excited to present this work looking at the way open science has been discussed on Twitter. Um, we're specifically interested in this because obviously open science is a topic that inherently revolves around discourse between the scientists and the public just by definition. And there's a lot that uh, computational techniques can help to tell us to better inform our uh, communication management and our public relations work uh, when we're trying to uh, engage uh, in, in helping to educate the public and helping them to uh, join in the conversation uh, as partners. I do want to add that uh, Dr. Van Dyke wished that he could uh, be here for this presentation. He has a uh, meeting with uh, department chairs today, uh, but Denise, I'm sure he'll appreciate the uh, shout out in your uh, last presentation when he sees the video. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll gloss over some of the details of this presentation. Uh, we can come back to them uh, if, if necessary when we're uh, uh, discussing presentations after the fact. Um, but obviously, open science is uh, certainly a topic of growing importance, and science as a whole um, really involves uh, engaging with the public, trying to do some uh, some level of public good. And again, uh, uh, computational techniques can help to inform uh, some of these uh, some of these. Uh, practices in which we routinely engage. Um, open science in particular represents an especially important paradigm shift in the way that scientists engage with the public because it's inextricably uh, connected with how we're engaging with one another and with society as a whole. Now, in terms of uh, open science, anecdotally, we understand that discourse around this topic has shifted over time. We understand that conversations don't tend to just remain static for years on end, but we don't have a great idea about how that conversation has evolved, how open science has been discussed in the first place over a period of many years, what shifts actually occurred in the discourse, and why those shifts happen. So naturally, that's what we sought out to address within uh, this study. So we looked at, again, what are the key topics in discourse, focusing on Twitter, because at the time, it was a very easy source of uh, information and a primary means by which scientists engaged with the public about open science. And we looked at how the uh, prominence of different topics evolved over time, how uh, the relative uh, um, representation of those topics shifted compared with one another to see how the conversation evolved. We use the Twitter API to collect public tweets uh, related to open science, dealing with uh, any of eight different keywords at all related to this topic at hand, which comprehensively represented public discussions about open science as a whole. We This uh, culminated in data set of about 1.2 million tweets about open science from the start of Twitter all the way through uh, August of last year. We then used a latent feature Deerslay multinomial mixture model uh, to analyze the uh, topics within that discourse. This is part of a family of short text topic modeling techniques that are more suitable for dealing with uh, tweet-like data than more traditional topic modeling approaches like latent Deerslay allocation, which assume that uh, any given document in a corpus is a combination of multiple distinct latent topics. Uh, generally speaking, a tweet may uh, focus on one topic if even that much. So we need specialized means to address that, hence why we used uh, LFDMM in this particular case. 
We then use stepwise segment or regression analysis to identify longitudinal breakpoints within the conversation, inflection points at which the conversation fundamentally shifted over time. And we then analyze both uh, the conversation itself as well as external events to the discourse in order to determine what the root causes appear to be behind the changes that we observed. In terms of uh, what the topics were, we uh, used topic coherence to settle on uh, the uh, model, which we settled on a seven topic model uh, of, of that discourse. Uh, Euclidean Krippendorf's alpha was used to uh, verify that indeed uh, the, al the uh, allocation of words to different topics was consistent across a fourfold cross validation process. And we, again, here were the seven major topics we identified, which related to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. There were some references to a genomic research, but topic two primarily dealt with use of uh, French and Indonesian languages. Topic three revolved around emojis and logographic languages like Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Topic four uh, dealt more with artificial intelligence. Uh, topic five dealt with references to specific open science events and programs. Uh, we then had uh, German and certain romance languages like uh, Spanish in the mix. And finally, topic seven related to informal dialogues. As for how these topics evolved over time, uh, again, we uh, conducted a stepwise segment and regression analysis using these compositional data. We dropped topic five from this analysis, both because it was less conceptually interesting and because statistically it didn't appear to have uh, much variation over time. It was very stable in the discourse. So we focused on the other six topics in, uh, in lieu of that one. This ultimately yielded 10 conceptually meaningful and statistically significant breakpoints. Again, for the sake of time, while we have our statistical results, I'll go ahead and jump into what was actually occurring at these points in time. So we have a, a, a couple of uh, major shifts here in uh, 2012 through 2014, which primarily revolved around a temporary uh, increase and in stabilizing in uh, informal discourse. Um, much of the early part of the conversation was very unstable, highly volatile, um, in large part because there were so few tweets being made about open science in the early days of Twitter. And so from one tweet to the next, there was a lot of variation in how people were communicating. This started to stabilize around 2012 and early 2013. Uh, in addition, we had uh, some spikes in, in engagement, uh, uh, French language uh, engagement in uh, early 2014, just related to a, a few major events that were happening within France uh, dealing with the topic of open science. Uh, later on, that in 2015, we had uh, really these uh, emojis coming into significant prominence, especially in the second half of that year, with uh, Unicode giving its official release of Emoji 1.0, Twitter formally launching its own implementation shortly thereafter, Oxford declaring an, uh, an emoji its word of the year back in 2015. A number of things happened to make emojis much more prevalent in discourse in general, and that certainly applied to the discourse on open science as well. We also, again, had a, uh, a short-term increase in French language tweets, primarily dealing with a uh, consternation over the cost of journal access and the widespread uh, need for the public to be able to access scientist research. Moving uh, on right. to late, late moving on to one minute to go. Thank you. Moving on to late 2016, early 2017, we had some spikes in a German and, and Romance language discourse, primarily related to open access programs being launched. And then in 2018 and early 2019, we started seeing uh, discussions on blockchain, especially related to uh, scientists, uh, uh, related to platforms designed to boost open science, as well as, uh, uh, interestingly, in early 2019, the start of a very long-term increase for the rest of the data set in engagement in Japanese language, which revolved around how-to content and research summaries. So essentially, this uh, latter point was uh, involved uh, not just the discussion of open science, but the practice of open science using the tweets themselves, a fundamentally different way of leveraging the Twitter platform to engage with this topic. These results demonstrate several key phenomena related to public discourse on open science uh, involving the supplanting of the open science discussion by promotional content, the differences in terms of how different languages uh, ultimately engage with, uh, with the discourse, and it provides a roadmap for future research in this area. So for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and stop here. Thank you very much.
for your time and I look forward to your questions. Wow, Brian, that was quite a lot uh, to process and it really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, I think that the way you've done this, it's, it's cutting edge methodology that I'm sure many people would want to know more about. The fact that you took on such a massive data set over so, such a long period in a multilingual study, there's so much to, to digest there. Um, but what I am particularly interested in as well is how it breaches scholarly communication and public communication. It, it reminds me of that idea that I often talk to scientists about that, you know, you can no longer separate the two. What we do in academic journals spills over into the public domain and, and vice versa. And we, we can't think of, you know, I, I want to publish, but I, I'm not interested in, in public communication. It's, it's all merging. And, and I think your presentation also I want to ask you one quick question before we go on to the next presentation. If you had to repeat that study today and you were looking for a platform, would you use Twitter again? In the short term, potentially moving forward, I it, it will a lot will depend on what happens with Twitter in, in the next few months and years, particularly as um, there's been some concerns about the legitimacy of the platform and the delegitimization of um scientific or really factual communication on that platform honestly a lot to me depends on where scientists go and if scientists as a whole keep trying to work with twitter then that's the place we should study if there's a migration elsewhere and hopefully if the public migrates with them then that's where research needs to lean as well okay that's that's a fantastic answer thank you so much that was really amazing and i hope we have time to come back to more questions um, at the end and so our last presentation today is um, Ifat Zimmerman from um, the Technion, uh, Israel Institute of Technology. Um, it's about uh, reader engagement and popular science articles. Once again, a crucial topic for us um, in the world of science communication research and practice. And please over to you, Ifat. Are you still on mute, Ifat? Okay. Hi everyone. Today I will talk about engagement with science news predicted by the use of accessibility strategies. Public engagement with science is critical to well-informed and active citizenship in democratic policymaking that expects citizens to help set the agenda for science. It is particularly essential in the age of post-normal science where socio-scientific issues pose wicked problems that require societies to make complex trade-offs. Socio-scientific issues are science issues with social implications. They involve ethical and value questions they are controversial due to different points of views, and they relate to local disputes. As such, they are debated in the public sphere. Science popularization in the media simplifies scientific content to enhance accessibility by employing different practices. Such practices are termed accessibility strategies. These are elements of design incorporated into the text to help non-experts understand the content. Some contribute to clarity, others to visualization, relevance, or style. Can accessibility strategies predict audience and engagement with science news? Given the importance of public engagement with science, it is vital to understand what might foster or hinder it. There are three dimensions of engagement cognitive, the mental course of information processing, affective, positive or negative emotions, and behavioral participation actions. Here we studied four leading Israeli science news websites that publish popular science news in Hebrew for the general public in Israel. They are peripheral journalism actors dedicated to covering only science-related topics written by science experts in a journalistic style. 
They distribute their content to social media and general news outlets, and they allow readers to comment. We ask, how do accessibility strategies used in popular science news correlate with and predict reader engagement? To address this research question, we content analyzed the items and reader comments. The analysis of the items was according to 13 accessibility strategies classified into four clusters, clarity, visualization, relevance, and style. I specifically point out uh, jargon, explanations, local aspects, and socio-scientific issues that will be further discussed. The analysis of reader engagement was in uh, three dimensions, cognitive, affective, and behavioral. Here is an example of reader comment with cognitive engagement. We examined whether assertions, question, uh, justification, ground, disagreement, or criticism appeared in the uh, comment. We also calculated a variable that summarizes the six cognitive engagement expressions. In the affective dimension, we examined whether reader comments included positive or negative emotions. And in the behavioral dimension, we counted the number of words per comment and the number of comments, emojis, and shares per item. We also calculated the correlation and used a predictive modeling. The correlations between accessibility strategies and reader engagement expressions indicated that they relate. The darker the color, the stronger the relationship. Two notable patterns of relationship were detected. The first pattern, socio-scientific issues and local aspects correlated with more cognitive engagement expressions and more negative emotions. Socio-scientific issues and local aspects were found to be linked as 57% of items addressing socio-scientific issues also addressed local aspects. Socio-scientific issues relevance to daily life may explain the, their direct relation to cognitive engagement and their controversial nature may explain their direct relation to negative emotions. We also found that articles addressing socio-scientific issues increase the odds of cognitive engagement. Considering that, we suggest that addressing socio-scientific issues in popular science news could serve to motivate public engagement in the cognitive dimension. It can fertilize the discussion and promote readers' understanding and inform science communicators about public opinions and concerns. The second pattern, jargon and explanations correlated with less cognitive engagement expressions and more positive emotions. Jargon and explanations were found to be linked. The higher the jargon level, the more explanations were provided. Research has shown that the presence of jargons hinders knowledge processing fluency, and providing explanations did not reduce the negative effect of jargon. In the context of this research, a text overloaded with jargon may be clarified through various accessibility strategies such as explanations. However, it remains vague to some respects, making it difficult for non-experts to express themselves cognitively. We also found that articles with high jargon level increased the odds of positive emotions. As it stands, despite readers' difficulty to cognitively commenting, they seem to appreciate the website's effort to clarify the text by expressing positive emotions. Narrative writing style also were found to increase the odds of positive emotions. Research has shown that comments expressing positive emotions are likely to increase people's interest in reading the article and may foster further engagement. I will conclude by saying that accessibility strategies used in popular science news relate to reader engagement and can predict different dimensions of it. Specific 
specifically, addressing socioscientific issues increases the likelihood of cognitive engagement, while using jargon decreases the likelihood of cognitive engagement, even when explanations are provided. However, it increases the probability of positive emotions. Using narrative writing style increases the likelihood of positive emotions as well. This study adds to the understanding of how to drive meaningful public engagement with science to empower a more collaborative audience. However, further research is needed to draw more conclusive and practical implications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ifat, for a really fascinating talk. Um, I mean, I know that you say at the end that more research is needed, but I think this kind of evidence base of what works, you know, takes us, it, it helps us to move towards a place where we can actually make recommendations about what works, what doesn't work based on, on evidence, not just on a gut feeling. And it's so important. I want to ask you one question, maybe to kick off the discussion. And then we, we do have about 20 minutes left before we have to end this session. Um, you were studying, if I understand correctly, and please help me if I don't, uh, the science news websites, I mean, the content there is primarily written by journalists, right? So my, uh, can you please repeat the question? Okay, so I'm asking the content that you were studying in your study on these science news websites. That's mostly written by journalists, if I understand correctly. So my question... No, they're be, not. It's no, not. Is it written by not. scientists? No, they are. Uh, they have an uh, advanced academic uh, degree in science. Uh, however, they are not journalists, but they write in a journalistic style. Okay, okay. So, so my question then is: um, Do you think that you know you, you've already highlighted some things that we can do, write in a narrative style, reduce the jargon, etc.? Do you think that that based on your study? we can give at least already some practical advice to scientists who want to engage and write in an engaging way for a public audience? Uh, yeah, one of the recommendations would be to uh, focus on uh, social scientific issues, which is relevant to lots of uh, the, uh, daily aspects of life and relevant uh, to everyone. Okay. So, so to, bring it, to bring it home to people's everyday lives. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I want to open the floor now to anyone. Any questions, comments, things you agree with, or just something you liked, or something else that you can add? Anyone in the in the room, please. You can either put up your hand. You can you can type in the chat. You can you know I'd love for you to to unmute and and put on your camera if you want to say something. If you don't have a question, I have something else that I would like to put to the whole team, then maybe um, give you a bit of time to think about what you would like to ask. What I was interested in in the presentations is when audiences respond, you get both positive and negative comments. I'm thinking about the one example, you know, this is really interesting. And then somebody else will say there's a lot of rubbish in this article. So what is your advice? What, what would be your advice, whether it's on Twitter or on websites or you know platforms like we discussed? How do you, how should we engage with differently with the positive and the negative feedback or engagement from from the public? And then I'm going to come to you next, Petra. So anybody from the panel wants to maybe respond to that, or, or indeed anybody? Yes, Denise, please. Um, well, and from our experience in the study in the NASA study we it's a biggest study we have run a multimodal analysis as well which is in another publication but um what we found out that uh, the lack of audience moderation really damages the relations of the among the audience itself so especially if you're like a public I don't know university or like a research institution or as a government agency such as NASA, and you just leave people kill each other online, that's also very damaging because uh, it negatively re engages with your content. So making all these efforts for pulling out, I don't know, a 50 second reel to explain something and not doing anything about it, it's not, it's not really helpful. 
So what we actually suggest in the second study we were working on to publish is to how to moderate these situations. It's a little bit of online crisis management. Uh, so you really need like well-trained uh, so, uh, community managers online to respond or like even ban people that's like pursuing and insulting others. That's not a uh, um, really good strategy to leave them on. So that will be my answer first. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also found it interesting that you said, if I remember correctly, that the audience is often appreciated if the scientists themselves are there, if they are part of the conversation. And I think that's, yes. that's such a valuable lesson as well. Yes, and I link to what Ifat says, because I have seen that mostly in papers and also through Ifat's histor story, it, there's a high correlation that if you just do like a random video of explaining a voiceover and showing graphics, people is not engaging. But if you talk to them one-to-one, -one, like here is how to prevent COVID contagion, or if you got COVID, this is what you have to do. And I'm like, doctor, this, this, and that from this institution. People engage is better. Like they start making questions, they start sharing. Uh, so people wants to see your face, wants to talk to you directly. So that's the, the lesson on social media. However, time-wise doing that, not every researcher is open to do that. And I kind of do a little bit of PO work for other projects, such as the experiences of Dr. White. And I also have a question for her, like how to convince researchers to be more present for the non-experts, because that's also challenging. They believe that sometimes that's not like are a lack of rigor of your work, like showing up on a TikTok or showing up on a, on a reel for the people. So that's also a challenge. It's a big challenge. Let's, let's get back to that if we have time. I want to give Pietra an opportunity to ask a question. Yeah, thank you very much, Marina. Um, yeah, my question also goes to Denise. Um, and it is if uh, NASA could benefit from the results of your research, meaning have you been in contact with them or did you have a chance to present your findings to the NASA uh, social media team? So uh, me and my co-author were big fans of social media. We teach through social media, she in journal, me and PR. And we managed to send the results of the first published paper, the multimodal analysis, which was published in Multimodality and Society last October. And uh, they have been really open to lessons. So for example, we have seen that First of the main content was just male scientists, you know, there wasn't like people from color or there wasn't people, you know, from the International Space Agency collaborating between nations. And that's also like a demonical. So it, we just suggested like this, this and that. And they have been really open to listen. And now if you check the NASA's content now, there's like women astronauts talking about their days, like even like how you wash your hair in the space or things like that. So so far it has been good. We haven't been like too much in contact. Like they just think and say like, oh, we will take a look at this. And we just saw that the content uh, start to like shift a little bit, but we cannot regard that all that change to our work. They have a wonderful team, even like a UNM alumni working in there. So that's a wonderful student. So was a wonderful student, now it's a professional. So yes. Wonderful. Cool. Um, in fact, there are a few people who asked uh, whether your study has been published or will be published soon. People are very keen to get hold of that paper, I think. Sorry, uh, just unmute. We are working on it. Uh, it is a, on the process and hopefully it will be uh, published in the following um, a couple of months okay, from now. Fantastic. So maybe when the time comes, we can you can use the PCST network to announce the study because you're welcome to use that. And then people who are members of PCST will also get the notification. Um, mm -hmm. Nura Lange, okay. I wanted to ask you if you wanted to say something about the time issue and maybe your experience of working with scientists. We know that time management is a, is a big factor and it sounded to me like you maybe have some experience of that. 
Um, I am actually have a background as a scientist, but um, I mean, I'm a graduate in science and I'm currently in science communication. And I'm working with people, I mean, I'm working with scientists in my faculties and mostly people are not keen to, you know, to be in science communication, to talk to science communication. So, yeah, and so that's a question to, I think it was, sorry, um, the person who discussed about the NASA IGTV. So, yeah, that's why. And then plus, there's no incentive for scientists in my country, in Malaysia, to do science communication. So, you know, and that on top of that, they don't have time. They are not incentivized. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what are other things about this? So, there's... There's an interesting debate to be had about incentives versus, you know, some of the benefits that are sort of built into this to the engagement. But of course, it, it does in the end, you know, time is a big issue because, you know, in the end, scientists have, have many competing demands on their time. So thank you very much for, for raising that issue. We, we can't get away from it. I personally believe, and I'm going to go to Judith next, and you may want to add something to this, but I think that PIOs can play such a crucial role in taking away some of the demands on the scientists by helping them, you know, facilitating the engagement, being the catalyst that make it all happen. Often PIOs play this role behind the scenes and they don't often get recognized for it, but, but they, I believe in my experience, you know, they can really help scientists and, and make a big difference in the demands on the scientists' time. But what, what did you want to add, Judith? Well, my uh, comment was similar. Uh, at uh, when I was working at Texas A&M, we did have the uh, capability to make, for example, uh, video news releases. And usually PIOs uh, know how to, um, you know, record things. They could help scientists develop a social media presence. They could help them develop a YouTube presence uh, because one time aspect is I'm trying to think like a scientist. And if I have to go out and buy a camera set up and learn how to edit my video and everything, I'm gonna say no way. But if there's someone there to do it for them, I think um, you know that, that would be very helpful. And I think the world is shifting to increasing use of uh, video. And uh, I would be interested in uh, you know, what Ifat did looking at the accessibility uh, to look at some of these, there's thousands of science YouTubes worldwide available. Uh, they're not always made by scientists, one of the problems, but to, uh, you know, look at what is the accessibility of the science in those videos. So I'm very interested in her methodology, and I hope that perhaps we can get the slides because of everyone, because uh, all of the people uh, who presented have given me some ideas of how to proceed with some of these things. Thank you. I want to maybe ask a question next of Brian, because you, you spoke about uh, Twitter and the fact that, you know, we know in the past, at least, we'll have to see how this develops, but that's that platform has appealed to scientists more than other social media platforms, maybe also as a way of connecting with fellow scientists. What is it about Twitter, do you think, just in your own, I mean, I know it wasn't part of your research, but just your view, what is it about Twitter that makes it more appealing to scientists than, than other platforms, social media platforms? So, sure, so I think it's a, a combination really of, of two factors, um, uh, just off the top of my head. Number one, it's where a lot of people have been. Uh, there, there have been a, a small number of social media platforms um, in, in which the lion's share of participation on social media has been at least in the Western world. And, and so Twitter has been among them for a number of years alongside Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and so forth. Um, the other key aspect of Twitter that I think made it very appealing for scientists to engage with it is that textual content was very easily discoverable in contrast with, say, Instagram or YouTube, which uh, privileged uh, multimedia content, and in contrast with Facebook, where you might be connected with your Facebook friends, but it tends to be very difficult to connect with people you don't already know, Twitter's affordances makes it very easy to search for different types of content and to have things 
show up in, in your feed just based on you know, here's something that might be interesting to you, that recommendation algorithm. Again, that's historically been the case. Things seem like they're shifting a bit now. But I think in terms of the initial impetus for scientists to use Twitter as it, their means to their primary means to engage with the public on social media, those two factors played a, a significant, uh, significant role in driving that. Fantastic. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. I also want to go back to our very first speaker briefly, uh, Marcelo. Uh, you had those three classes of scientists and, and you did acknowledge the need for further analysis. Like something that I would be fascinated to know is how the younger scientists compare with the, you know, the more senior established scientists. But the question in my mind, and I'm going to ask you to speculate what, what you think, is, is it possible to move a scientist, you know, to, to, to convince them of the value and the benefits of engagement, to change their views from a position where they may not regard it as very important, somehow by experiencing it or by providing incentives or training to, to making them con, you know, see it as a more rewarding and necessary part of their careers? Yes, uh, that's a wonderful question. Actually, uh, it demands a, a longitudinal um, uh, research. So it would be necessary to, to make another, another survey in some time to 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 verify the, the transition between classes so so who is the people who, who, who uh, go to another class and why they do this this is would be another uh, a great research question for for the for the study and about this uh, uh, um, age uh, uh, question you 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 made um uh, difficult for for this in my research is that uh, the, the the population I I address at the the survey is uh, uh, scientists uh, uh, already uh, experienced uh, uh, scientists so for example uh, it it demands a, a minimum of four years of a uh, a PhD to 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 um, to submit to to. To, to 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 submit to this fellowship so uh i could not answer this question with my data but yes it, it, it it's a very interesting question also yeah. fantastic well I, as i say all good research um uh you know will will lead to more research and there was also somebody who said something that i thought was a wonderful comment and that that good writing you know good science communication also leads to engagement so if we do if we get this right it's also always a spin spin off effect I think it's been a fascinating session. I would really love to thank all the presenters once again. I would like to thank Linka, my, my student, for helping me set this all up and making it all run smoothly. Thank you to all of you who joined us to listen, to join in. I want to maybe add a, a final comment at the end. In my own experience with scientists over many, many years, and I agree with you, Judith, it's wonderful. I, I was in the role of a PIO or similar for many years. That access to scientists is absolutely amazing. That's certainly part of the ecstasy of the job. But what I've experienced anecdotally and also a little bit in my own research is that scientists are sometimes initially hesitant, but once they start doing it and once they start experiencing some of the rewards, you know, the just the, 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 the feeling that you, you know the meaning that they also get from from engaging with public audiences it really um changes their view about it they often see benefits that they never expected and my other key takeaway that also links to what what many of you have talked about today is learn from others don't try and do it all alone you know work with your pio work with social science researchers and um, there's no need for scientists anymore and it wouldn't make sense for them to try all of do all of this um, on their own so science communication has simply become too sophisticated, too multifaceted, it moves fast, and scientists need, need to work in a team to get this right. So thank you again for a fantastic session. I really couldn't um, have asked for a, a better um, set of, of topics and speakers, and, <coughs> and I, I look forward to, to actually viewing all of this again when we have the video available. I would love to ask the five speakers to stay on just for 30 seconds. I want to do a screen grab just of the speakers so that I can tweet something about it. And thank you so much for everybody else as well.